for Muslims, blocking the way is by ruining their acts of worship. So this blocking strategy has two. One for non-Muslims who would like to accept Islam. And for Muslims, he blocks it by ruining their acts of worship. One of the ways, Prophet Sallallahu told us, when you're in Salah, and you make rukur, and you feel something, as if you might have passed wind. Prophet had said that that is actually one of the agents of Satan. There, when you bow over, he blows on your behind to give you this feeling like, oh, something happened. <laughs> so, what do you do? He said, if you don't smell anything, you didn't hear anything, just ignore it and carry on. Why? Because if you don't, then he's got you. You go back, you make wudu, you come back and you stand again, you bend, ah, there it is. <laughs> back and making wudu again. Or next time, okay, you got past Ruku, you're down in sujood, uh oh, got it again. <laughs> and then salah becomes a huge burden on you now. You, know? you see some people, if that's one way, the other way is, you know, where are you, uh, the waswasa. You see some people making wudu, they'll spend half an hour before salah making wudu. They make wudu, ah, spot. Did I get all the spots and did I wipe my head? No. Or before the salah itself, where people have this niya that they're told, you know, you have to get this niya out there. You know? And the niya has to be perfect, you have to be completely focused. And one brother was telling me that he I prayed beside a, a brother here, and he was there. <laughs> he pre finished his prayer, and the guy is still going. When he's finished, he said, what happened to you, man? You okay? So why you didn't just do and start? He said, I didn't see the car. <laughs> <laughs> you know? blocked. It's from Shaitan. Because who said you had to see the Kaaba? Some people say that. Yeah, yeah. You know, brother, before you start, you must be so focused, you can see the Kaaba. <laughs> Your Ibadah is messed up. So the deen becomes hard. It becomes a burden. Salah becomes a major burden. You don't want to pray. You have to go through all of this. Another way is, in terms of blocking acts of worship, is, <clears throat> I know for people usually in Pakistan, India, the Hanafi, modern Hanafi school, they teach that Salah to Asia consists of 17 rakat. No, that is. Your night prayers, Isha prayers, are 17 rakat. Two sunnas, four farm, then three sunnas, two nafils, two dip. They put all of this together and made it like the whole thing is far. I remember when I was teaching high school in Riyadh, a number of my students <coughs> were from Pakistani backgrounds, they'd been in the States, grown up in the States, whatever. And a number of them, they tried to hide and skip away from prayer because it was just so burdensome. Thor is, you know, 10 rakat. It's just, everything is big numbers. 
So when I told them, Zuhur is four rakat, they said, what? <laughs> it's, it's only four? And the Isha is only four? What? I said, they said, we can do that. <laughs> we can do that, you know? So Alhamdulillah, they started doing their fart, establishing their fart, because it was just so burdensome. And of course, what happens when people have 23 raka'at and 17 raka'at to do, they're doing it like what? At light speed. Because you want to finish it, get out and do what you have to do. And then what happens? Because you made your salah at light speed, you lost all the value of the salah anyway. So all the 17 was useless. Your ibadah has been ruined. So these are among the ways that shaitan continues to block the believer from worshiping Allah. The next route is to cause psychological and physical harm. Now this is where magic and these things come in. Magic is in fact one of the ways that he does affect people. Breaks their worship. We know that magic is real because some people have this idea, well, no, no, magic only affects those who believe in it. It's not real. It's a psychological thing. If you believe in it, you can be affected. If you don't believe in it, you're okay. So what happened when Rasulullah was affected? Because we have authentic hadith. Sahih Muslim, Sahih Bukhari, he said that was affected. By, by Sahar, by magic. So we know it has a reality to it. It's not just about you believe or you don't believe. It is real. And that is why the Mu'awwadatan, the last two surahs of the Quran, were revealed for dealing with circumstances where people are affected by magic. To break the spells. So Islam has provided a legitimate way for dealing with it. Of course, unfortunately, there are people who exploit this reality and turn it into something else. So we have something we refer to black magic, but then there is also white magic. Mm -hmm. Black magic is like the bad magic, but then there's good magic. No, no, no. All magic is haram. There's no good magic. If a person is affected and magic operates through the agency of the jinn, there's a connection. If somebody offers to treat your case and he's talking about calling on the jinn or asking you to go do this and that or to plant stakes of salt in your, you know, around your house, you hammer it into the ground and things like this, please know that this is shame. This is not about treating magic. This is magic in itself. They're involved in magic. They're drawing you into acts of shit connected to magic. Locking you in. The methodology of the Prophet is very clear. He gave us ruqya to say, he gave us things to do, whether it's eating ajwa dates, writing different instructions which are authentically recorded. This is what we depend on to deal with it. If it doesn't work, because we tried and it doesn't seem to work, then 
whatever is happening to you or whatever may be a medical condition that you just have to be patient with. But in the end, you have to put your trust in Allah. You don't, out of desperation, now reach out for anybody who's offering anything. Because when you reach out and they give you something and it works, you're lost. Because these things are happening with the agency of the jinn. So when they offer you an amulet, you wear this amulet and it will protect you. And when you put it on, the thing stops. You think the amulet worked. But actually, it is his relationship dealing with the world of the jinn, where they stop affecting you because you've done that to convince you that what he has done, what you've done wearing an amulet, is actually a good thing. So you have no end of people in the Muslim world who put amulets on their kids. It's standard on their arms, and on their waist. Animals. Shaitan can also affect us through our dreams. Prophet Muhammad had said that there are three types of dreams. The dream which comes from Allah. Some narrations you refer to it as the true dream. Others refer to it as the good dream. Dreams which come from the person himself. Just the mind, ramblings of the mind, things that he did in the day or he heard or he read, whatever, regurgitated in his mind at night. And dreams which are from Satan. Frightening dreams. That he refers to as frightening dreams. So, Satan and his forces from the world of the jinn can enter into our dreams. So, we need to know what and how and where we should deal with them. The good dreams, which are from Allah where we either see good things, we see ourselves making hajj. We've been thinking about it. And, you know, can I do it this year? Can I not do it this year? Maybe I should wait till next year. And then we have a dream about hajj. It's encouragement. Good dream. Or it could be a true dream where we see something in a dream, and a few days later, it actually happens. It happens. This is from Allah. And it's not just to believers. It happens among human beings around the world. It's a sign that Allah leaves with them that there is because it isn't from themselves. They are not able to do it. They don't, can't control it. They don't know the future. 